We're ready. Uh, okay, so great. welcome to our one before the last session. And uh, I guess today we're kind of switching gear after we built all the mathematical framework uh, to start delving into complex networks. So I'll leave it for Dr. Professor Radner to uh, kickstart. Kick okay. Well, thank you very much. So um, the, these two lectures are going to be mostly devoted to complex networks. And uh, because I've already had slides prepared for this for giving talks in other venues, I just stole from my slides to make a presentation. So I'm going to, I'll try and be slow, but please stop me with questions. And, and certain places where it's a little bit more details are needed, I will stop the sharing and maybe do a little bit of on the whiteboard. So um, I sort of gave the plan um, last time about what I'm going to talk about. And so here's, here's the plan for the next two lectures. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get to the very end, but if that's, we don't get there, I think that's fine. So anyways, let me begin then with this so-called erdos reni random graph, which is the simplest mean field-like model for network growth. And um, it's actually kind of a funny thing. Uh, let's see, I have to be able to advance my slides here. Hmm. Um, just bear with me a second. Strange, I can't seem to do it. All right, the, the slides are moving. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, no, no, it's just that I can't. Do, I was trying to do it remotely, and it wasn't. It wasn't doing anything. Anyway, so the point about the erdos reni random graph. First of all, it's a very simple and beautiful idea. That's number one. And number two is when there's a beautiful and simple idea in physics, there's usually not one person who came up with it first. So it turns out that. The erdos reni random graph, as we know it, was actually invented by Florian Stockmeyer in the 1940s. And then Solomonov Rappaport, Gilbert, erdos reni they all invented it at different times, but somehow the name erdos reni random graph stuck. And so the idea behind the erdos reni random graph is as simple as simple can be. And um, so the idea is that you start with n isolated nodes, and then you put in links to join them and so one way of defining it is that it's what's called the G of N L, the graph with N nodes and L links in them. And so if you think about a static process where you just say, I'm gonna take L links and just sprinkle them randomly to join nodes together, one can study the geometric properties. But because this is a uh, lectures on non-equilibrium processes, I wanna turn this into a non-equilibrium or kinetic process. And as we'll see, this kinetic perspective actually provides a nice way of thinking about the problem and also solving the problem. So we start with um, n isolated nodes and we introduce links at a constant rate. So here I am introducing links at some constant rate and me as a user, I'm free to choose my rate of introducing links to be anything I want. And so because I have this freedom, let me choose that uh, rate of adding links to be n over two. And you'll see why it is in just a moment. So first question we might ask is, well, um, you know, how many links are there in the network at a given time t? So because I'm introducing links at a rate um, n over 2, at time t, the total number of links in the network is n over 2, which is the rate, times the time, so that's n t over 2. And as I mentioned last time, one of the basic observables in a lot of these complex network problems is the average degree of each node. And so the degree of a node is the number of links attached to a node. And so the average degree is just that degree of each node averaged over the entire network. Now, every time I add a link to the network, each link has got two endpoints. And each endpoint adds one to the degree of the two nodes at the end of the link. So that means that the node degree, the total degree of the, of the entire network is going to be twice the number of links because each link adds two to the total degree. So the average node degree is the total number, twice the number of links divided by the number of nodes in the network. And you see that by choosing my rate of introducing links to be n over two, the average node degree is growing linearly with time with a coefficient of one. So that's just kind of a, a convenient choice. I mean, we can choose any rate we want, but this turns out to be a convenient choice because now I can write down a master equation for the evolution of the degree distribution. And since I know the rate at which the degree is changing, that provides like the constant in the master equation. So let's write down um, an equation for the degree distribution. Um, and so 
let me define little n sub k is the fraction of nodes of degree k. So this will be capital N k, the number of nodes of degree k, divided by the total number of nodes in the network. And this quantity satisfies a very simple equation. And, I, and now because I have the, you know, the benefit of, of having slides, I can color code my equations. So every time there's a black term, that means it's a gain term. And every time there's a red term, it usually means a loss. And so how does a no fraction of nodes of degree change? One way it can change is I can take a node of degree k minus one and join a link to it, and that'll increase the probability of having a node of degree k. So there is a gain term, which is proportional. And by the way, can people see my cursor? Can, can people see my cursor? Yes. 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 Okay, great. So, uh, so the rate at which nk grows will be proportional to the fraction of nodes of degree k minus one. And similarly, if I attach to a node of degree k, I will lose nodes of degree k. And so there's a loss term, which is proportional to the fraction of nodes of degree k times the rate at which new links are coming in, which is rate one. And that's why the coefficient in front of this equation is equal to one. And so this equation has a very simple solution because this is just the equation for the Poisson process. And again, there's two ways we can solve this equation. One is you can just solve it one by one. And because this equation is so simple, starting with n1 dot is equal to minus n1, the solution is e to the minus t, and then you can plug it into the equation for n2 and solve uh, recursively, or you can solve it using the generating function technique. So I invite you to try and do this on your own because it's a nice exercise. And what comes out of this is just the good old Poisson degree distribution. So that is one of the main results of the erdos randy random graph is that even though we're putting in links randomly, the degrees of the nodes are actually uh, very narrowly distributed because there's an exponential tail. And if you plot this Poisson degree distribution, it looks like a very sharp distribution and the limit in, in the long time limit, this goes over to a Gaussian distribution whose average value is equal to T because we, you know, that's how, how quickly the number of links is growing in the system. And the width of the distribution is proportional to the square root of t. So uh, in this particular case, we have what's called a narrow degree distribution. And, um, and that is one of the main results of erdos renyi random graph. So another feature and a really outstanding feature of this erdos renyi random graph is the existence of a transition, a percolation transition as a function of the number of links. Because we saw just from the picture in the previous slide that at the very beginning, I had just n isolated nodes. So I have n isolated clusters, basically. And as I add links, we're joining up clusters. And so the number of different clusters is shrinking with time. And the size of the clusters is growing. And clearly, when I get to uh, putting all the links in the system, I have just one single cluster of size n. And if n goes to infinity, that means there's a divergent cluster at the end of the process. But the crucial point here is that there is a phase transition at a, non, at a finite time uh, where the average cluster size will diverge in the, in the thermodynamic limit. And so that's the other feature of the erdos renyi random graph that I'd like to try and uh, illustrate now. So this is the issue of what is, is understanding the percolation transition. So here's my picture of the erdos renyi random graph at some time. And, um, Let's just look at two clusters inside of this erdos renyi random graph. So I'm gonna label them as the green cluster and the purple cluster. And a natural question you might ask is, well, how quickly does the cluster size grow? And, one, and to try and isolate this, let's look, determine the rate at which the green cluster and the purple cluster will actually merge and make something even bigger still. And because this is a purely mean field random process, the rate at which a cluster of mass i and mass j will grow. So here, here are my two, the masses of the two clusters. So here what I'd call mass is the number of nodes in the network. So I have a cluster of n i nodes or mass i and a cluster of j nodes or mass j. And what is the rate at which they might join together? Well, clearly since the links are happening randomly, the rate is proportional to the size of the cluster of mass i times the size of the cluster of mass j. So if the two clusters were to merge, that merging rate is proportional to i times j. 
And if you think about this in terms of our picture of aggregation kinetics from um, you know, you know, previous lectures, in aggregation kinetics, we have exactly the same process. We have clusters of given masses, they join, and here the joining rate is proportional to ij, so we can write down a rate equation for the evolution of the mass distribution, just as we did in the case of constant kernel aggregation. Now we have an emerging rate, which is proportional to i times j, and so that's going to be the, uh, you know, th that's going to be the additional term in the master equation is this i times j. So let me just write down, based on the fact that the merging rate is proportional to i times j, let me write down the master equation. And here it is. Um, uh, whoops, now, now it's not advancing again. I don't understand this. Hmm, hang on a second. All right, spacebar seems to make it work. Anyway, so here are the master equations with the cluster concentrations. And again, um, this, should look, this should look pretty familiar to you because there's a gain term. And so it's proportional to ij times cicj and the sum of i plus j equals k. And then there's a loss term, which will be kck and then product summation ici. So it looks, it should look familiar to you. It's just that now the merging rate is proportional to ij. And for this equation, it turns out that the generating function technique can be used to solve this equation. And it is solved in textbooks and even, even a textbook that I have co-authored, we have the solution given there. It's rather more advanced than what we did in the case of constant kernel aggregation, but it's still within the realm of doability. And so let me just write down the solution to it because I don't wanna go through any of the mathematical details. And the solution is just this. Um, and so you see that the solution is a rather simple looking analytic form, and it doesn't look terribly um, singular anywhere, but it turns out that buried inside of this, because there is a K factorial, which and K factorial is like e to the, is like K to the K, e to the, e to the K, roughly speaking. And so the K to the K will cancel out K powers of K in the numerator. And if you work out all the details, you'll find that at t equals one, this distribution changes from an exponential decay. So for early times, the exponential term wins out. But as time gets longer and longer, this, this, this term starts playing a larger role. And magically at t equals one, this has a power law decay, k, k to the minus five thirds. Um, and so in particular, if I look at the second moment of the cluster mass distribution, which is a measure we've learned already is the correct measure of the cluster size, this diverges at t equals one. So when the time reaches one, the density of the number of links is now n links in the system. And when there's n nodes and n links, that's enough to ensure that essentially there is a global merging of all the small clusters and there's the emergence of an incipient infinite cluster that eventually will swallow the entire system when you go to t equals infinity, or in this case, t equals n. That's when there'll be every single link is occupied. And since, since I'm thinking about the thermodynamic limit, t equals n means t going to infinity. So this is the one of the outstanding features of the Erdos-Renyi random graph is this percolation transition as you go from t less than one when there's like many isolated clusters to t equals one, where everything joins up into one infinite cluster with a few tiny isolated clusters remaining that will eventually get swallowed up as t goes to infinity. So that's um, everything I wanna say about the erdos Rainey random graph. And so this is a good place to just ask if anyone has any questions. Okay, so everyone's quiet, so I hope it's okay. So um, I wanna now turn to like probably the main part of the next two lectures is understanding the growth of complex networks. And um, it turns out that the idea, the basic idea was actually already uh, understood by a paper by a guy named Ewell in 1926. And more importantly, in a very, impo in a, in a very uh, seminal paper by Herbert Simon in 1955. And basically, he understood a lot of the mathematics underlying complex networks, but he did not have a geometric perspective. And he also didn't have the data that we have now that shows that 
everything that we think about in the world is kind of can be looked at through a network perspective. And so there was this pioneering paper by Barabasi Albert in 1999, which married uh, some of the mathematics of the old of the old masters with modern data analysis and modern uh, the fact that we had uh, data for network systems. In particular, they were looking at the structure of the internet. And so they came up with this notion of the preferential attachment model, which you know, sparked basically a revolution in, in uh, non-equilibrium statistical physics. So this is where I'm going in the next, you know, for the rest of this lecture. So let me try to um, frame this uh, problem of network growth in the framework of citations. So imagine that at early times, there's only one book, the Bible. And so that's going to be publication number one. And so if somebody like, say, Newton writes Principia Mathematica, him being a very religious person, presumably somewhere in his book, he has referred to the Bible. So Newton, write, Newton writes Principia Mathematica, and he cites the Bible. And now let me think of a very toy model in which you're allowed to have only one citation when you write your publication. So along comes maybe Leibniz, who um, you know, is a, is a uh, you know, rival of Newton. And so he comes in to write his treatise about calculus. And maybe even though he hates Newton, he has to cite him. So he cites Newton. And similarly, in comes paper number four. It's allowed only one citation. So perhaps it cites the Bible. And so what we're going to build up here is a citation network by introducing nodes one by one, each one allowed to cite one previous other paper. Uh, and then we can ask, what is the structure of this network? Um, and, and that's the basic point of what I'm, I'm going to be doing in the next you know, hour. Now, this is a very toy model, as you can see, but it does contain a lot of the richness of all complex networks. And you might wonder, like, why am I restricting myself to just one citation per paper? And it turns out that, first of all, that gives a tree-like network. So that's, that's perhaps quite unrealistic. But it turns out mathematically that allowing more than one citation per paper, you get more or less the same behavior as one citation per paper. So let's just always look at the simplest case because it contains all of the richness of the more general model. So we're introducing nodes one at a time sequentially. And the only other input into this problem is the rate at which you attach to a previous node. And so I'm going to define an attachment rate, A sub K, which is the rate at which you attach to a node of degree k. And so the degree of the node is the only characteristic that we care about. If a node has high degree, like a paper which is very popular, it's possibly more likely that we would cite a popular paper rather than an unpopular paper. So this feature of the attachment rate is um, our basic control parameter of the process. And um, so in the case of what's called preferential attachment, we can imagine that the um, attachment rate is an increasing function of the degree of the network. And what Barabasi Albert became very famous for was they introduced the notion of linear preferential attachment, that uh, the rate at which you attach to a node of degree K is linear in the number of nodes. So this sort of popularity driven um, mechanism is called linear preferential attachment, and it's on, been on everybody's minds. And in some sense, it has this feature that the rich get richer. If I have a highly cited paper, if people just cite me because I happen to be highly cited, that makes it easier for me to be even more highly cited. So the, this preferential attachment is also a, a, a way of sort of um, mathematizing the notion that the rich get richer. And so what we're interested in this problem is the number of nodes of degree k, um, the degree distribution. So this is in some sense a basis observable in these complex network problems. So as we've seen in the case of the erdos rennie random graph, the degree distribution was very narrow. It was a Poisson distribution. So it has a characteristic number of nodes t and a width which scales like square root of t. On the other hand, in a, say a regular lattice, every single node has exactly the same degree. A square lattice, every single node has degree four. And what we're gonna see in this case is that uh, for uh, preferential attachment, we can get a broad degree distribution. This leads to the notion of what are called so-called scale-free networks where the network has no natural scale in it. 
because all possible degrees exist in the network. And what the goal I'm gonna try and show you is that by using the master equation approach, we have a very natural and very powerful way of actually computing the degree distribution in a very satisfying way and get we can get lots of profound results with not that much work. So that is the goal uh, now is to actually compute the degree distribution. Okay. So here it is, the, the degree distribution. And now, because some of this work is actually more on the new side than the old side, so now I'm, I'm you know, I'll add maybe some references of people who've done various things. So there was papers both by Kurpivsky, myself, and Francois Levra in, two, in the year 2000, and Dora Govsev and company, also in the year 2000, who used the master equation approach to solve the degree distribution. And I'm going to present our approach because why not present my approach? So um, here is the master equation. And again, I hope that things are going to look very familiar to you because it's the same techniques that we've been, I've been showing you throughout these lectures. So I want to ask, how does the degree distribution change every time I add a new node to the network? So one thing I want to um, um, emphasize here is that there's no notion of time here because the only observable is the number of nodes in the network. So our time-like variable is actually n. So I'm going to write my master equation where like the, the time-like variable here is n because no need to refer to any artificial time. So when I write time derivative now, I'm always going to mean n derivative. And so now, as you might expect, there should be two terms in this equation. There should be a gain term and a loss term. And so let's look at what they are. And so there is a gain term because I can attach to a node of degree k minus one. The rate at which I attach to a node of degree k minus one is this attaching rate a sub k minus one. And so if I want to increase the number of nodes of degree n, of degree k, I'm sorry. So I want to attach a node of degree k minus one and the prefactor a sub k divided by a, the, the, just a itself, this is the, the denominator is just the total rate of attaching anywhere. So the ratio a sub k minus one divided by a is the probability of attaching to a node of degree k minus one. And so this is the gain term. And then there'll be a corresponding loss term because I can attach to a node of degree k with a rate, with a probability a sub k divided by a, or, and, and this gives me the, the probability that I lose a node of degree k. And then there's one more term in this equation because whenever I bring in a new node into the system, the new node has a head of the arrow, as you saw in the previous slide, and the tail. And where the tail is means that I've created one new node of degree one because if I'm a new paper coming into the literature, I have one reference allowed. And so I cite one other previous paper. So that means that my, the new paper that comes in that I've just written by definition has degree one. So I'm always adding one node of degree one every single time. And so the Delta function here, the Kronecker Delta, which is one only if K equals one means that every single time step in this process, which means every single time I add a new node, I'm adding one new node of degree one in addition to like changing the, uh, the degrees of the nodes in the, in the existing network. So this is our master equation. And I hope that you appreciate again, the black is gain term, the red is a loss term, you, that even though it's, this is not a necessarily easy equation to solve, it should look familiar to you that it has the same characteristic structure of a gain term and a loss term. The only new feature now is that there's an additional gain term because of the existence of the source, which is every time I add a new node to the network, I also add a node of degree one. And so our goal will be to solve this equation. Okay, so we need to make some kind of assumption to proceed. And so let me make the following assumption that there is preferential attachment. That is the rate at which attaching to a node of degree K is an increasing function of K. And in the case where this exponent gamma was one, that is the linear preferential attachment model that was solved originally by Barabasi Albert. But what I'm going to show now in the next, you know, in the next few minutes is that, well, we can deal with arbitrary values of K. And it turns out that linear preferential attachment is actually a very strange special case. And, um, and you'll see why, you know, as, as I go along.
Okay, so one last point here, which turns out to be important for like getting insight about how to solve these equations is that if I go back and look at what is the total rate, so by definition, the total rate, first of all, it depends on the size of the network because the bigger the network, the more places to attach to and, and the structure is changing. So the total rate of attaching to the network will be depend on the, character, on the uh, structure of the network itself. And by definition, it's just the sum of the attachment rate to a node of degree J times the number of nodes of degree J. And if I'm doing um, preferential attachment, then um, you know, this power law preferential attachment. So I plug it in here and hopefully you recognize that this is nothing more than the gamma moment of the degree distribution. So I will write this as M sub gamma of N. It's the gamma moment of the degree distribution. And it turns out that recognizing the total rate is this uh, moment of the degree distribution will be very useful in understanding how to solve the problem. So when I'm given like a set of equations that looks like this, um, you know, as we already saw in the case of aggregation kinetics, you might want to try and solve it just by frontal assault, just try and solve it, you know, equations one by one. But oftentimes one gets useful insight by looking at moments of the distribution itself. So let's look at moments because they're simpler to deal with. And as you'll see, it gives us a useful insight into solving the problem. So um, let's look at moment equations. So let's look at the equations for the zeroth moment and the first moment because they're particularly simple. So now I have an over dot. So M zero dot is the time rate of change of the zeroth moment. But again, here time is the same as N. So what M zero dot means is DM zero by D capital N. And so by definition, the zeroth moment is nothing more than J to the zero NJ, which is the same as, uh, I'm sorry, it's J to the zero NJ summed over J. So that's nothing more than NJ summed over all J, but some, nj over all j, that's just the total number of nodes in the network. It's nothing more than capital N. So d capital N with respect to dn is nothing more than one. So the zeroth moment is one. And if we look at the first moment, well, what is j and j? So by construction, j and j is the average degree of the network. But as we saw already in the case of the erdos reni random graph, and it's true for any graph, every time you add a link to the network, you've added two to the total degree of the network. So um, basically all you get then is twice the number of nodes in the network. So J and J summed over all J is nothing more than two N. So when I differentiate with respect to N, I just get two. So what we've learned here is that the zeroth moment of the distribution and the first moment are both linear in N. And then if I go back to my attachment rate, which was the gamma moment of the distribution, as long as gamma is between one and zero, then this should also be proportional to N. And that turns out to be an important simplification. So the total attachment rate, which is the, the gamma moment of the distribution, well, so that should be proportional to N. And so let me call that constant of proportionality mu, and so mu will be a function of the exponent of the attachment rate, but as long as it, uh, gamma is between zero and one, then uh, it, you know, it's just some number. And, that, and it turns out that the number can be computed uh, numerically, but it's, it plays, you'll see how, what role it plays and what's gonna follow. So again, the case of linear preferential attachment, which is perhaps the most famous case, is falls into this. In the case of gamma equals zero, it turns out to be a very simple special case. And you know, for most physically reasonable situations, it seems reasonable that this exponent gamma is going to be between zero and one. So it, because it physically it corresponds to something that makes sense, uh, the case gamma in the range zero to one, uh, as we're gonna see, but that's the case that we're gonna be able to solve in, in, in a rather complete way. Okay. So one more thing, uh, and this turns out to be really crucial, is that we now saw that the zeroth moment and the first moment were linear in N. The attachment rate is linear in N. The structure of the equations, as, you, as I wrote them down, they kind of suggest that the number of nodes of any given degree, this capital NK of N, is also linear in capital N. 
So let me make the ansatz that the number of nodes of degree K is proportional to the size of the network. That is, if I double the network, I will double the number of nodes of any given degree. So in some sense, the once I scale out the time or scale out N, the network develops a, 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 uh, a static structure. And so if I make this assumption, something magical happens because if I now go back to my original equation of motion, so you see that if capital N is proportional, capital NK is proportional to N, if we go back and stare at this equation, so here, if capital NK is proportional to N, then the time derivative just makes this little n. And over here, I have a, a capital N buried inside of NK. I have a capital N buried inside of A from here. And so the capital Ns cancel everywhere. And what I've done by this very simple trick is that I've changed a differential equation, a system of differential equations into a system of algebraic equations. I mean, it's recursive, but it's just algebraic equations. And this is the trick that we use to solve for the degree distribution of preferential attachment networks. So this is where I'm uh, headed now is I'm gonna take this recursion formula and I'm gonna beat it to death basically and, and extract as much as information as I can from this recursion formula. Okay. So, here is our equation that we that from the previous slide. And so how do we solve it? Well, first of all, look at the term nk equals one, little nk equals one. So when I look at the term for n1 or the equation for n1, in that case, there's no gain term because if there's nothing, if there's nothingness, I can't create something out of nothing. So there's no, in that case, this term is absent. So if n1 is equal to something involving n1 and a one, and so that means that we can solve for n1. Oh, I didn't, I didn't mean for that thing to come back. So we can solve for N1. Once we have N1, then the equation for N2 will be N2, it'll involve N1 and, I mean, N1 and N2. And so we can recursively solve for N2 as a function of N1. And so we can recursively solve. And so if you do that exercise, then you end up with this simple product form for the distribution. So in some sense, this is the exact solution for preferential attachment networks. And now what we need to do, because you know, oftentimes with exact solutions, they're exact, but they're opaque because like, what does this mean? And so what I wanna do now is extract some meaning out of this exact solution. And so that'll be the goal of the next few minutes is trying to extract as much as I can from this uh, formula. So again, our, um, there's one more thing in this formula, which I just wanna mention is that there is this unknown number mu, which was this, um, amplitude of the attachment rate. And so the way that we can actually compute it is sort of we can do a self-consistent thing because um, by definition, mu was, uh, you know, mu times n was a gamma -th moment of the distribution, which was like the total rate. If I divide by capital N, then I'll get mu itself is nothing more than the sum over all sizes, A, the attachment rate times the fraction of nodes of degree K. So if I take my original equation here, multiply by a k and sum over all k, then I'm going to get mu. And so I will have a self-consistent equation for mu because I'll have mu on the left-hand side equals the sum of the, everything on the right-hand side. And then the overall mu cancels out. And so you see, I have a very complicated looking equation for mu itself. And so one only can extract mu numerically, but as we expect, mu ranges between one, when gamma was equal to zero, which was no preferential attachment, to two, when we had linear preferential attachment. And we can look at the asymptotics in both limits, but the, you know, all of this is maybe a detail, but all I wanted to say here, the only thing that matters is the fact that mu is a varying number that depends on the attachment rate exponent and it lies between one and two. That's all that we need for, for all of this. So once we have this, now we can like try and extract something useful out of this uh, formal solution. And so it turns out that the value of gamma is really crucial and, it, and we get different universality classes depending on the value of gamma. And so what I wanna do is I wanna look at 
um, the simplest cases first and leave the most interesting case of linear preferential attachment uh, to the end. So let's first of all look for gamma less than one, so sublinear preferential attachment. So this means that if you're very popular, if you're that the rate at which you, you uh, people will cite you or that people will become friends with you is not a linearly increasing function of your popularity, but sublinear. And we can ask like, what is the structure of, the net, of a network with this so-called sublinear preferential attachment mechanism? And so it turns out that this is what comes out. Uh, you end up with what's called a stretched exponential degree distribution. So here you see in the exponent, there is a k to the power one minus gamma. If gamma is strictly between zero and one, that means that the power of k here is less than one. So I have e to the minus k to a fractional power where the fractional power is less than one. This is called stretched exponential decay. And the reason it's called stretched exponential is that uh, when k is equal to one, which is exponential decay, we have a, a certain decay, a rapid decay of the distribution as a function of k. When k is less than one, then the decay is slower than exponential. And generically, this is slower than any exponential, but faster than any power law. So it's a broad tail distribution, but not that broad in the sense of broadness for power laws. And it turns out, as you see from the formula, that for any value of gamma that's strictly bigger than zero and less than one, you'll always get stretched exponential decay. And so from the point of view of uh, you, you know, modern statistical physics, we would call this the universal generic behavior of the uh, degree distribution because it's the same stretched exponential decay for all values of gamma between zero and one. So let me uh, spend a little bit of time showing you how to derive this. So um, here, and so here maybe uh, let me uh, stop for a second and, and just go to uh, the board because it might be, okay, so I'm, I'm back to the board. So the point here is that we had, um, we had NK, which is equal to uh, mu over AK product over all J, one to K. And then I have um, one plus mu over AJ to the power minus one. And so in the case of uh, AK, was proportional to k to the power of gamma. So this thing is equal to mu over k to the gamma. And then I have the product one plus mu over j to the power of gamma minus one. So question, like how do we resolve this product? And the trick I'm gonna show you is very generic in the case where the product is in the form of one plus a correction. So when I have a product like one plus a correction and one plus another correction, one plus another correction, it really depends on how quickly this correction is vanishing as a function of as J gets large. And the way to try and resolve this is first of all, notice that we can write a product. We can write this in, without any fancy stuff. We can write this as e, e, EXP of the logarithm of the same thing. And this I can write, so when I have logarithm of a product, that's the same as the sum of the logarithms. So this is nothing more than EXP. And also because there's a minus one here inside of the logarithm, let's take that minus one out. And so that it'd be minus summation. And so this product was J, J equals one to K. So this is now sum J equals one to K of logarithm of one plus mu over j to the power gamma. And the next step here is now let's expand the logarithm when this argument is small, which happens when j gets large. So asymptotically now, so now instead of having an equal sign, I'm gonna have asymptotic to because this is only true in the limit of large k of exp minus. And also the other thing here is that if we're interested in the limit of large j, then we can convert the sum over discrete indices j to a continuous integral over, over j itself. So we, we convert the sum to an integral dj that goes up to k. 
And the lower limit doesn't matter because we're interested only in the limit of large J. And then we expand the logarithm for small, um, for J getting large. And so the first term is gonna be mu over J to the power gamma. And then there's gonna be like the second term, what's this with a minus sign, minus mu over J to the gamma. So this mu squared J to the two gamma two, and then dot, 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 dot. So um, that is where I got to. And so now let me go back to sharing my screen. Um, so, yeah. And so um, that's where, that's what I, I showed here. And so this is kind of the standard set of steps, which I just showed on, on the whiteboard that allows you to convert an infinite product to, um, a, 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 to a sum. I mean, to, you know, like I take the E, you know, I take a product and make it E to the sum of a logarithm. And then I change the sum to an integral and do some asymptotics on that. And that's the way that I can extract some behavior, uh, the asymptotic behavior in that way. So just proceeding along that way, um, it turns out that, um, you know, when I integrate this, well, it, it's what's going to matter is the value of gamma is going to determine whether or not each of these integrals is going to be divergent or, 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 or convergent. And so it turns out that when gamma is between a half and one, well, here, you know, say, for example, it's three quarters. Well, this will diverge at the upper limit, and that'll give me the leading term k to the power one minus gamma. And if gamma is between <laughs> zero and a half, just a question? Not a question, just can you just point on the slides because we barely see the whiteboard now. Uh, if, if you're just pointing to uh, terms in the slides, that would be Oh, better. I see, okay, so I'll only, okay, very good. So um, thank you. All right, so again, what I had here is that when gamma is between zero and one half, this x, this part, this integral will be diverging at the upper limit. That gives me this contribution k to the one minus gamma. This term is an exponent bigger than one, which is a convergent. Whoops, uh, and what happened? It gives me a convergent integral, and so that's just a number I don't have to worry about. And so that's why there's no other additional correction term here. And then as gamma gets closer to one, you get more correction terms. But the crucial point is that the leading behavior is always as k to the power of one minus gamma everywhere. And so this justifies the fact that um, in the limit, in, in the case where gamma is less than one, we get this universal stretched exponential decay. Okay, uh, let me present one more special case before I kind of get to the main punchline. Uh, so when gamma is larger than two, which is a really very, um, you know, pathological case. It means that like, if I have a little bit of popularity, I am, the rate at which people attach to me is so dominant that basically everybody attaches to me and nobody is, it gets attaches to anybody else. And so I'm going to call this the Bible phase in the framework of citations. And so the idea behind this Bible phase is that the attachment rate is so much uh, bias towards the highest cited paper, basically nobody else ever gets cited. And so how can we create this Bible phase? And so here is um, the way that that can happen. Uh, if I have um, a Bible, that means that Newton refers to the Bible, Leibniz refers to the Bible, Da Vinci refers to the Bible, everybody's referring only to the Bible. And suppose that we build up a biblical society where everybody looks at the Bible and nothing else. And it's a biblical society where we already have N people who are, who are citing the Bible. And now the question is, what is the chance that the next person who comes in actually attaches to the Bible? And uh, now my, every time I switch, this sort of doesn't work right. So here is the next person coming in. And what is the probability that this person attaches only to the Bible? And so uh, mathematically, this is a simple thing to calculate because if I have um, N nodes, which are already attached to the Bible, what is the rate at which I will attach to the Bible? So the Bible has degree N 
And if the attachment rate is proportional to n to the power gamma, so the probability of attaching to the Bible will be the rate of attaching to the Bible, which is n to the gamma, divided by the rate of attaching to, divided by the sum of all the other rates. And so I attach to the Bible with rate n to the gamma. I could attach to any one of the other guys who has degree one with a rate one, and there are n such other nodes. So the total attachment rate is n divided by n to the gamma. And so this is the probability that uh, the next person comes in attaches to the Bible. So the probability of making this very theocratic society where everybody attaches to the Bible is just the product of these factors, product from n going from one to infinity. And so that's um, this factor here. So this is the Bible probability. And what I wanna show now is that this expression has only two answers. If gamma is larger than two, the Bible probability is non-zero. Whereas if gamma is two or less, this Bible probability is actually uh, zero. So that is the main result here. So let me again stop sharing and just let's do that exercise because it's a very simple exercise. And it also shows like, you know, it's the same mathematics as what we're doing over here. I guess I have room to do it. So I have my Bible probability P, which is equal to the product. Uh, and it goes from n equals one to infinity of um, one plus n to the one minus gamma to the power minus one. And what I'm going to do now is exactly the same thing as over here. I'm going to rewrite this as um, exp logarithm product one plus n to the one minus gamma to the power minus one. And so again, we convert the product to a sum. So we'll get exp. Uh, and then um, I'll, I'll skip the step here because I, I, so it'll be equal to changing the sum to a product, but I'll just write it now as the last line. I'll write it as an integral going to infinity of um, logarithm of one plus n to the one minus gamma. So um, this is dn, and then I have um, n to the one minus gamma is the asymptotic behavior. So this is now asymptotic to. So going from here to here, I just did the steps here. I just converted the, you know, I convert the product to an exponential, the logarithm of the sum. I take the minus one and put it out here. I make the sum to a product, and then I expand the logarithm for, for large n. And uh, then we have to just evaluate this integral. And you see here that this integral has two possible answers. If, um, if gamma larger than two, then that means that this is dn divided by an, uh, n to a, a power that's bigger than one, which is convergent. And if I have a convergent integral here, this probability e to the minus something finite is a finite number. So that says that p is bigger than zero. But if gamma is less than or equal to two, then this integral is divergent. So if the integral diverges, I have infinity here, e to the minus infinity is zero. So I'm gonna get P equals zero. So that is um, the main point of this. And so let me go back to my slides. Um, And so the point here is that this Bible phase exists for, for gamma larger than two. It turns out that for gamma between one and two, there is, um, I'm not gonna spend any time on this because it's, it's mathematically kind of weird, but, and I don't even have a good name for it, but in the case when gamma is larger than one and less than two, the chance of making a Bible is not exactly perfect because some people do get cited. And so one ends up with a situation where the Bible dominates, but it doesn't dominate everything. So there might be a few people who have a few citations, but the Bible basically has almost all citations. And so the last case, and here I'm gonna stop for a break, is linear preferential attachment. And so what I'm gonna show is that in the case of linear preferential attachment, one gets a power law degree distribution, but crucially the power law is non-universal. So this is kind of a disconcerting feature uh, of this model, which is that normally we think in the case of 
non-equilibrium processes or even equilibrium processes that when you have universal, when you have power law behavior, it involves something involving kind of a interactions among all scales. And because of that interaction of all scales, one likes to think that this is universal. And in this particular case, it turns out to be non-universal. And so I'm gonna take a five minute break now um, and then I'll continue in five minutes. And if you have questions, just feel free to ask. So everyone's very quiet. I just hope it's not because we're, I, I hope it's clear and it's just the fact that we're 8,000 miles apart. I hope you're seeing our end of the camera. Uh, yes, no, I see the class. They're, 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 they're in the process of writing, so it's kind of promising. They're not completely missing all of this stuff. Okay, so. okay. We, we'll let them record. Okay, so uh, what I've shown now is the case of sublinear preferential attachment gives you a universal stretched exponential decay. And for gamma larger than one, there's kind of a singularity occurring where one paper dominates everything or one node dominates everything. And now I wanna focus on the case of linear preferential attachment because that is the case that first of all, the most famous has the most beautiful mathematics and also has the most non-universal behavior. And that's part of the reason why it's so cool. So uh, let's look at the case of linear preferential attachment. So once again, here is our exact solution for the degree distribution. And again, I'm gonna apply the same uh, approach as I've done before, which is I'm gonna write the product as exponential of the sum of the logarithm. And then I'll take the sum and make it into an integral. And then I'll expand the logarithm for large j, in which case the one term goes away and I just have exponential e to the minus mu dj over j. And notice that when I have in the exponential dj over j, which happens for linear preferential attachment and only linear preferential attachment, the exponent here, this exponent is minus one. And when I integrate one over j, I'll get log j and I have e to the logarithm, which is power law, and the exponent of the power law involves this amplitude mu. And so only in the case of linear preferential attachment, there's this kind of magical confluence of ca cancellations such that I'll get a power law dependence and that power law. So again, when I do this integral, I'll get mu log K and then E to the mu log K is nothing more than K to the minus mu. And so I'm gonna get ultimately K to the minus one from the K here, and with a power mu, which is in principle depends on the amplitude mu. And so this is where we get non-universal behavior. Now there's one little caveat here that I should mention, which is that I did mention earlier on that we were dealing with power law preferential attachment where AK was proportional to K to the power gamma, then the value of mu was like something that went between one and two. And so you might say, well, and if I'm doing linear preferential attachment, we sh I showed you that uh, mu is equal to two. And so if I put in mu equals two, I get k to the minus three. This is the result that was first found by the paper by Barabasi and Albert and made them very famous. And by the way, one thing about the Barabasi Albert paper that maybe you know, or maybe you don't know, apparently it's, one of, it's either the most cited paper in science or one of the most cited papers in science in the hundred years of the, that this journal has been in, in operation. So it's amazing that being at the right place, at the right time, with the right idea, you can be very, very famous. But the point here is that I said here that this is non-universal because this exponent nu can actually be any value larger than two. And so, um, and the reason why I said that or, or why it's non-universal is that when I, if I assume the attachment rate is k to the gamma um, with gamma equals um, one, then that would just give me the exponent equals three. But my attachment rate could be actually constant plus k to the gamma. And so if it's like constant plus linear, that constant turns out to be the thing which is gonna make this exponent non-universal. So the point here is that asymptotically, linear preferential attachment means it could be linear plus lower order corrections. And as we're going to see, these lower order corrections actually play a really crucial role here such that you can get non-universal behavior. 
But for the fun of it, let's just first of all, look at a very simple special case. So I'm gonna solve exactly the special case of a strictly linear preferential attachment because that's the most famous case. So, you know, again, I want you to feel a little bit more comfortable with like doing these products and whatever. So let's, let's work this out because it's a nice little exercise. So let me stop this again um, and go to the whiteboard again. So um, let's look at the case. So we have, we have this general formula that NK is equal to mu over AK and then have product J equals one to infinity. And then I have one plus mu over AJ minus one. power minus one. So let's look at the special case, AK exactly equal to K. And in this particular case, then the total rate A, which is equal to summation, AK NK, which is equal to summation K NK, well, that's equal to two N. And from this, we infer that the amplitude in front of N, this number mu is equal to two. So let's go back here. And so we have now two over K product J equals one to K. And so let me put this all, let me put this, uh, let me put everything over AJ. And so I'll get AJ and then I'll flip it over and I'll get A sub J, which is J divided by J plus two. So that is what we have. And so let's just write this out, two over K. And so the first term, J equals one. So there'll be one over three, two over four, three over five, dot, 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 dot. And as you get closer to the end, we'll have here say J minus two over J, J minus one over J plus one. And then I have the last term J, I'm um, sorry, sorry. The term here is k minus two over k, k minus one over k plus one, k divided by k plus two. That's the last term in the series. And now you see that there's a lot of cancellations going on here. Um, the three cancels with the three, the four is gonna cancel with the four over here, the five cancels with the five, there'll be cancellations going tw over two terms. And so this K minus two is gonna cancel the K minus two, two terms back and so on. The K minus one, two terms back will cancel this K minus one, this K cancels the K and then everything else is left behind. And so what is left behind? There is a two over here, a two over here. So it's equal to four and then divided by K, K plus one, K plus two. So that is the exact degree distribution uh, asymptotically exact degree distribution of strictly linear preferential attachment. So that is um, one very nice case. Okay, so let, let me go back to the slides. Um, okay. So what I wanna spend the rest of today's lecture discussing now is this notion of redirection. And it turns out that this is both important from the point of view of the results that come out and also important like algorithmically, because now that you've seen this notion of linear preferential attachment networks, a very natural thing one might wanna do is one would want to simulate this network to understand maybe in more detail, like what's happening realization by realization. So if you wanted to simulate linear preferential attachment, so think about it from an algorithmic perspective, how would you do this? You have a bunch of nodes, each with its own degree, and then you've got to attach to a node of degree K with a rate proportional to its degree. And uh, in principle, this means that you need to know global information about the network. You need to know the degrees of every single node so that you can figure out what is the probability of attaching to a node of degree K. And from the point of view of computer science, there's algorithms that have been developed that tell you that if you have like N different nodes and you want to attach to one of them with different probabilities, 
that the algorithmic time that's needed to like figure out the attachment rate is scales logarithmically in the number of nodes of the network. So that means to build a network of n nodes in principle should take a time of order n log n. And what I'm gonna show now is that in fact, to build a network of n nodes takes a time of order n, not n log n. And there is a, a very slick way of avoiding knowing the global information about the network that I think still we don't understand the full ramifications of it. So what I'm gonna show is that if you take uniform attachment, that is, I imagine a, a, a network where the probability of attaching to any node is independent of its degree. So uniform attachment, I attach to any node a uniformly at random. But then I add one more twist, which is that I attach to, not to the node itself, but I attach to its ancestor. That gives me linear preferential attachment. So you'll see how this works uh, momentarily. So let's imagine we have a network and notice again, the way that this network is built is that each of these nodes has a link that has an arrow on it, which says, who is your ancestor? I know that when I join the network, I know who my ancestor is. So that's easy to keep track of in computer memory. And so everybody knows who his ancestor is. And now let me do the following little game, which is that I pick a node at random. So here's a new node. And this new node picks any node at random to attach to. So here it's going to select a random target. And with probability one minus R, it actually attaches to that target. So if I attach with probability one, this is what's called uniform random attachment. This also has a name called random recursive tree. And uh, you'll see in a moment, but you know, you, if, as an exercise, the case of uh, um, random recursive tree is particularly simple because it generates an exponential degree distribution. But what I'm gonna do now is that some of the time I will attach to the node I pick, but with the probability one R, which is the complement of one minus R, I will attach to the ancestor of that node. So that's all there is to this rule. I pick a node randomly independent of its degree. I either attach to it with a probability one minus R or I attach to its ancestor. And the point is, the crucial point is that, uh, and this is related to something known as the friendship paradox, which maybe some of you have heard of, which is that if we look, if we poll everybody in the room and I ask each of you, how many friends you have? And you, know, you might answer three friends, seven friends, 12 friends, whatever. But then I say, pick a friend of yours. How many friends does your friend have? And on average, your friends will have more friends than you do. And it's known as the friendship paradox, but it's actually the crucial trick that allows us to like generate linear preferential attachment from uniform attachment. So the point here is that this ancestor node what is the rate of attaching to this ancestor node? All of the upstream neighbors, if I attach to any one of the upstream neighbors, then with a probability R, I will attach to the ancestor. So if I have a node that has an ancestor node that has more friends, it's more likely that I will attach to it. And so this is basically the idea of the friendship paradox that the attachment rate to an ancestor node is proportional to the number of upstream neighbors but the number of upstream neighbors is nothing more than the degree of this ancestor node because you know, this ancestor node has degree four. So I take away the downstream link because that doesn't play any role in this, attack, in this redirection process. It's equal to the number of upstream neighbors. And the fact that this number of upstream neighbors is, is equal basically to its degree minus one is what generates linear attachment from this simple algorithm that has no notion of knowing the, the degrees of anybody in the network. So that is the crucial step. So let's write down the master equation for this um, uh, redirection process. So hopefully this is gonna look very familiar. Uh, so the point is that with a probability one minus R over N, I pick any node of the network with a probability uh, one over N and with a probability one minus R, I'm going to attach to that node and only that node. And in that case, the degree distribution is just, since the attachment rate is one, so there's just NK minus one minus NK. And then this is with a probability one minus R, you create a node of degree one, which is the tail end of the arrow. So that is 
the first term in this equation. And then there's the second term where I do the redirection process. So again, with the redirection process, I attach to any node with probability one over N, I redirect with probability R, and then the rate at which you attach to a node of degree K is equal to the number of upstream neighbors, which is K minus one. So the gain term, I have a node of degree K minus one, and the rate at which I attach to it is a number of its upstream neighbors. And if I have a node of degree K minus one, it has K minus two upstream neighbors. And so that's the rate at which I attach to a node of degree K minus one. And then similarly, I could attach to a node of degree K with a probability proportional to its number of upstream neighbors, which is K minus one. And then I have also the tail end of the arrow uh, gives me a node of degree one. And then there's a factor R for the probability of actually doing this redirection process. So this is the master equation for redirection. There are two separate types of terms, one where I attach directly to the randomly chosen node with probability one minus R. And then there's a second set of terms coming because of the redirection process, which happens with probability R. And now we just do some simple rearrangement. So I just rearrange. So, you know, I just sort of gather terms together. And again, the crucial point here is that if I look at the coefficient multiplying NK, the coefficient is linear in K. So we've generated linear preferential attachment by the simple mechanism. So one point is that, yes, so from the point of view of uh, mathematics is yes, here is an algorithm that allows us to generate linear preferential attachment from a very simple local algorithm. But the other crucial point is that what seems to be global information in the network about the, knowing all the degrees is encoded in this redirection process. So I guess the crucial point here is that this attachment rate, A sub K is equal to this K plus one over R minus two. And so it's linear preferential attachment with an additive shift. And because R is between zero and one, that means that this, X, this uh, factor lambda will be between like minus one and infinity. So one thing that you might ask yourself, or like as a natural question that arises, is we, I've shown you that linear preferential attachment gave you a power law degree distribution. And you might say, well, who cares if I have a node of degree a million, who cares if the attachment rate is a million or a million plus three? Why should the three matter? And as we're going to see that additional factor of that additive factor matters in a very profound way, and it matters in a profound way for profound reasons. And uh, so that's what I'm gonna be doing in the next uh, few minutes. So, um, and again, the other point from the, from the perspective, maybe computer scientists, or if you wanna be some simulating these networks is that we have an order one rule that is for each new node that's at, at, added to the network, we have to do of the order of one, or two or three events. We have to pick a node at random. We have to either decide to attach to it or attach to its uh, ancestor. So we have like of the order of a few operations for each node addition, and that gives us linear preferential attachment. And so that's kind of amazing because normally you would think that you need to have global information. You need to know all the degrees to make progress. Okay, so, um, let us now compute the degree distribution for shifted linear preferential attachment. So once again, we're, we're doing the same game as before. We have to like take this product and you know, plug in A sub J is equal to J plus lambda and see what comes out. And so here's what comes out. And again, let me stop this now and I'll, I'll work this out because hopefully this whole game of playing with products and gamma functions it's gonna look a little bit more familiar as we go along, but let me show you the steps in doing this derivation because it's kind of fun. So uh, I'm going back to my slide again. I mean, to the blackboard. We still don't see the whiteboard. Uh, I the don't? Slide, yeah, the slide is still shared. So, oh, um, uh, uh, stop share, yes, sorry. Thank you. Okay, thanks. 
Okay. Uh, okay, so, so now we have AJ is equal to J plus lambda. So first point is we've got to figure out what A is. So A is equal to summation AJ NJ. And so that's equal to summation J plus lambda NJ. And we've already seen from the, well, I just erased here that the sum J and J was two N, some lambda NJ, well, la the lambda comes out and we just have some NJ, which is N. And so this is going to be nothing more than two plus lambda N. So that means that mu is equal to two plus lambda. So let's plug it in here. And so we're going to get equals. So mu is two plus lambda. And downstairs I have K plus lambda. And then here I have product. And again, what I'm going to do is I'll write this product uh, J equals one to infinity. And so I have A sub J divided by A sub J plus mu. So two plus lambda, K plus lambda product. And so AJ, so this is J plus lambda divided by J plus lambda. And now mu is two plus lambda. So let me, let me get rid of the mu here. So it's J plus lambda. So it's J plus two plus two lambda. And this product uh, J equals one up to K. And so now we know what to do because you know when when this when each of these terms was integer, we you know then it's a finite product. But when it's not integer, when lambda is some arbitrary number, then this is in principle the way that we deal with this is that we write it in as terms of ratios of gamma functions. So let me do that. So this is going to be two plus lambda, k plus lambda. So let's first of all look at the numerator term. So what is this? This is going to be nothing more than gamma. Ugh. I always have this problem that I write the beginnings of gamma and then I make it into an F. This is gamma of K plus lambda plus one. Because by the definition of the gamma function, the first term is K, you know, K plus lambda, K plus lambda minus one dot, 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 going all the way down to minus infinity. But to stop it, you would put here gamma of one plus lambda. And that will stop this at the term you know, the very first term in this is one plus lambda and this gamma to the one, one plus lambda means that this infinite product stops at the term one plus lambda. And similarly here for this guy, so now it's downstairs, we have this product, but it's the, the top term will be, it'll be gamma of K plus three plus two lambda. And then to stop it, when we get to the term one, we'll have here gamma of three plus two lambda. So, that's what we need to do. And then the only other thing here is notice that here, this is gamma of K plus lambda plus one. The first term is K plus lambda, which can't, so I can cancel this and, can't, and get rid of the one here. So our answer is um, two plus lambda uh, divided by, um, let's put all the stuff that doesn't depend on K in the same place, one plus lambda. And then there's gamma of three plus two lambda two lambda. So all this stuff here doesn't depend on K, it's just some number. And then I have this product, gamma of K plus lambda, gamma of K plus three plus two lambda. And if you did the exercise that I recommended to you last time, and if you haven't done it yet, I highly recommend that you do it, which is that we've learned that the product uh, like gamma of K plus A divided by gamma of K plus B limit K going to infinity. This is nothing more than K to the A minus B. So asymptotically, this scales as some amp the amplitude here that I'm not gonna bother writing anymore. And we're gonna have K to the difference of these two exponents. So it's gonna be K to the minus um, three plus lambda. So um, that is the result I wanted to show. And so now let me go back to the slides. Um, uh, 
And uh, the one thing which uh, I, I, I should have mentioned, which is that when I had this um, redirection probability r, that the value lambda was like one minus r minus two. And so the range of lambda here can be anything between minus one and infinity. So the degree distribution exponent can take any value between minus two and infinity. And so this is actually kind of, I would say an amazing result because it shows that we have non-universal behavior from what we think would be a universal uh, you know, underlying mechanism. Okay, so um, let, this is maybe a place to stop for just a minute and ask if there are any questions, because I'm leaving now the world of linear preferential attachment. And so if there's any questions, please ask them. Okay, um, Sarah, maybe you can give me some advice. I mean, is, is the level more or less okay? <laughs> Yeah, I guess the, the, they can answer the question. I think they're they're fine with the material. They're just in a, in a process of absorption. So okay, very good. So I've got about another five minutes to go. So let me just sort of preview what I'm going to do next, which is um, the process of network densification. So you know the, this whole field of complex networks has been very hot for now two decades, and it still remains quite hot. But along the way, I mean, there's lots of, lots of variations on the general theme. And one of them is a feature of what, I, what, my, what, one, what one might call network densification. And the point is that it turns out that in real life, there are two generic types of networks. There are what are called sparse networks. So sparse networks are one where the number of links is proportional to the number of nodes itself. So that means that each node has a finite number, has a, on average a finite degree, that the number of links to the outside world from a given node is a finite number. And so um, when I look at the total number of links divided by the total number of nodes, it means that it's going to a constant, which means that each, the, the average node degree is finite and independent of the size of the network. So that's what are known as sparse networks. And everything that I've shown so far, this linear preferential attachment mechanism, this is an example of a sparse network. And most networks that we can dream up in terms of generative mechanisms typically end up being sparse. But it turns out that in, in nature, in reality, there is another class of networks called dense networks, which densify as they grow. And what that means is that the number of links is in, or the ratio of number of links to number of nodes, which is proportional to the degree, is an increasing function of the network size. And you know, one way you can think about this is that um, you know, presumably you are all young people compared to me. And so you no longer use Facebook because that's for old people like me. But when I first joined Facebook, um, you know, it's like I first joined because my children were in Facebook and they said, daddy, you've got to join Facebook. And so I did what my kids told me to do. So I joined Facebook and every couple of weeks I get a message saying, oh, we see that you are friends with your son but your son has these friends. Maybe you wanna become friends with the friends of your son and vice and also for my daughter. And so in this way, you would naturally densify because you would you start by say joining two people in the network, my son and my daughter. And then I would be friends with their friends and friends of their friends. And I'd keep getting recommendations. You should join, you should become friends with so-and-so because he's a friend of your friend. And so this feature of densification is sort of a very natural mechanism in social networks. And it turns out that there's many uh, examples in real life of such networks. And so what I'm showing here is um, uh, the behavior of the number of links on the vertical axis versus the number of nodes on the horizontal axis for some uh, very prominent networks in the world. And so the archive network, the citations of archive in archive papers. Or for example, um, uh, email networks in, in large organizations. And so what I'm plotting here is number of links versus number of nodes on a, on a logarithmic plot. And in each of these plots, the slope of the line, the best fit line is larger than one, which shows the number of nodes, I mean, the number of links is growing faster than the number of nodes, which means that networks are densifying. And so, it's a natural question to ask, like what is the structure of these densifying networks? 
can we think of simple models that um, you know, characterize this densification and can we then characterize networks according to like uh, this densification process? So I guess in, I'm gonna just spend uh, one minute just sort of drawing a picture and then I'll spend next lecture like solving this model. But I wanna to present to you a very simple model of copying, which kind of mimics what happens in Facebook. And so the idea here is as simple as simple can be, which is that suppose we have an existing network and this turns out to be a very small network, only three nodes, but now, so it could be, it could have been, you know, like my, my family, for example. So I have, that's my, and my, my family is all connected to each other. And then somebody else comes into the, to the network. So for example, a new child is born and by definition, the new child is attached to its mother but as time goes on, the new child might attach to his siblings and his father. And so in addition to having one link to the mother, one could generate links to some of the other members of the family. And so the point here is that this model or this network growth process or in, in this copy model means that in addition to attaching to one node specifically, that's your mother, for example, you might attach to the other two members of the network and let's call a copying probability P, which is the probability that when I am born and I attach to my mother, so with the probability P, I will attach to I, everybody else in the family. And so with probability P squared, I will attach to everybody, both people in the family. With a probability P times one minus P, I'll attach to only one of my other members of the family. And there's two different ways of doing that for this very small network. With a probability one minus P all squared, I only attach to my mother and nobody else. And so what I wanna do next time is I'm gonna present what happens in this copying model as a function of P. And to just give away the punchline is it turns out that this copying parameter is, a, is an important parameter in the model. And for P less than one half, one has sparse networks. And for P larger than one half, one generates dense networks with very wondrous properties. And so next lecture, I will discuss the copying model, and then I'll discuss um, another model of redirection, and uh, that will bring me to the end of these lectures. So until next time, I guess, Friday. So I am done. Thank and, you. And any questions, just feel free to ask. You can also email questions to Professor Redner if uh, you're not fine asking questions live, so I'll if you don't mind, uh, Professor Redner, them sending emails. Yeah, sure. No, that's fine yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So until Friday. Thank you. Sure thing.